bad service out here. No, no, that's okay. It's okay. Uh, that's what happens when you go out to 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 Margaritaville, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate the shirt that you've uh, you've got on supporting the theme here. Thank you. It, it's it's one of many Hawaiian shirts that I have. Uh, I love I love Hawaiian shirts. So uh, yeah, I have a wide. They are variety. the peak of of men's fashion. I think I, I'm a I, I say that unironically. I love Hawaiian shirts too. Well, I mean, being being a fan, I imagine of Jimmy Buffett, I would not expect anything less. To at least yes, have absolutely. a few Hawaiian the, shirts. <laughs> When I when I left for college, my mom went in my closet and threw out like all of them. So I had to, I had to oh, re up. No. <laughs> oh man! Yeah, so, I, but I've I've had a decade to to bring them back. So there you go. <laughs> they're, they're very stylish, and they go with almost any occasion. So I think they do, and they're comfortable and hide your beer gut. You know, I'm a I'm a big fan. <laughs> exactly. They they're cut well and everything. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, Paul and uh, uh, Jenna Francis, thank you so much for uh, taking time out uh, to talk about your new film. I did get a chance to see it. My review will drop early next week. And and when I saw the concept of this film, I, I knew I had to watch it. And, I, and then after watching it, I knew I had to talk to the folks involved. So... Uh, <laughs> So, Paul, if you would mind giving my listeners just a brief synopsis of what your new film Murderitaville is about. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Murderitaville is about a group of friends on their way to a Jimmy Buffett impersonator contest. Uh, they stop off to do some pre-gaming, and then they are viciously attacked by a half-man, half-parrot creature. <laughs> Sorry, you just say half man, half parrot, and I I can't help but laugh because I, you know, I've seen a lot of horror in my my old age, and I don't think I've seen an actual half man, half parrot. I think closest was Troma's Poultry Geist, but I don't think I. Oh saw, yeah. <laughs> I don't don't think I made and that and a Jimmy Buffett themed horror film too. Uh, what what. <laughs> What was it that that made you want to do a film like this? You know, Mark, it's just I really wanted to combine my two great loves in this life, which are bad horror movies and Jimmy Buffett music, and uh, this <laughs> seemed like the natural way to do it. No, I mean, like I'm a I'm a weird person, man. If you can't tell from my movie, <laughs> I like a bunch of weird stuff, and uh, yeah, so I, I really unironically like Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> I like making silly horror movies. And so, yeah, it just seems like a natural fit. <laughs> well, it did. I mean, and the fact that you made it a parrot is also fitting because of the whole trap. Yeah, absolutely. Theme, trap, you know, trap rock and all of that. So, <laughs> so uh, Jenna Francis, how did you get wrapped up into this crazy film? <laughs> so, um, I had actually done a short film um, with a director named Benjamin like a while ago, and he's friends with Paul. And he recommended me to Paul and um, and Paul found my demo reel on YouTube and he thought that I'd be a good fit for the role, I guess. So I just joined in. <laughs> now, were, were you familiar at all with any Jimmy Buffett music before you took the role? Just like the basic, sure. so the two or three most famous songs. But yeah, I didn't much more than that. <laughs> Did, did Paul force you to listen to a bunch of it before the film or, you know, prepare for yourself for the role? Uh, he didn't force me to listen to any, but I definitely did start listening to some after. I, I really understand the script and there's so many references in it. So listening to the music helped a lot. <laughs> I, I'm i not a huge Buffett fan myself. I do enjoy the music when I listen uh, to it quite, you know, when it comes across uh, either the radio or on playlist or whatever i really enjoy it but yeah i'm not too familiar with it myself though i did like one of the characters at some point uh uh quoted the jimmy buffett it's my own damn fault when he's going into <laughs> what why what happened to his uh his wife and such and uh so and, and i caught a few of the other references as well so uh you know uh so paul how you know how did you assemble this cast was uh we uh no, uh, Jenna Francis got recommended, but what about the rest? Is this just a group of your friends that you got with together with, or? Yeah, you know, a lot of the a lot of the guys I are 
folks I went to high school with, um, and then people who I've just duped into being in my bad movies over the years. And uh, usually when somebody seems willing to, to do it and can actually do a good job and gets the jokes and stuff, they, they wind up cropping up in all my films. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know if Jenna's wised up and said, I'm not going to do this again with Paul, but uh, if she hasn't, you'll probably see her again. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> You you seemed like you were having fun, uh, Jenna, on the on the movie. Were you? Was it a fun set? Were were you this wild concept? I mean, uh, you know, uh, how easy was it to get into like the groove of things? Um, I think it was pretty easy to get into the groove of things because it was a very chill, really fun set. Because mm-hmm. we would just you know improv sometimes, just be really free. It was it was really fun. It was a good time filming. <laughs> And you kind of got to play the straight person of the group. It was like one of my favorite moments was, uh, which Paul, I imagine is kind of on purpose alluding to your love of bad movies is the whole, uh, man, it's so laid out and, and Jenna goes, it, it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, really funny. <laughs> the, it, the way you delivered that and everything, I'm like, yeah that's just you're you're like the straight person to this you're just like what are you people talking about (laughs) yeah (laughs) so so how much improv was allowed by paul or was paul a very strict director i'm going to put you on the spot since he's right here uh (laughs) um i mean i think if you just thought of a funnier idea you could just throw it out there and see if it would land well um, Paul came up with a lot of them though on the spot, so <laughs> it was good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Paul, uh, a lot of the comedy in here, uh, yeah, it really worked for me. Where'd you come up with the idea for the fence, though? I loved the fence gimmick. <laughs> so I have to, um, I have to give credit to that on that one to my my co writer Dylan, um, who actually does a part in the movie as well. He's a he's a nightmare to work with, and I hate him with every fiber of my being. But he's a very funny writer, so I have to keep <laughs> him around. Unfortunately, <laughs> he knows I feel this way, so I, I I'm not telling tales out of school. Um, but yeah, basically, I had written a first draft of the script that was like 30 pages, mm-hmm. and I was like, well, this isn't going to be long enough. So I called up Dylan, and he and I've written some things, and I said, look, I need you to to beef this thing up. And so he went in and. He basically created that entire character, who the guy who stands behind the fence. Um, so all of that is all out of Dylan's insane mind. And when he pitched me that concept of the guy standing behind the fence, I was like, I don't, that's, it doesn't make any sense. It's not funny. And he was insistent on it. And I have to give him credit for his insistence because he literally, we were filming scenes and he would go run downstairs to build that fence <laughs> out of some scrap wood that he had. Um <laughs> And I was like, dude, I, I don't think this scene's going to work. I was like, I, I think I'm going to cut it. And he was like, no, we have to film it. And there was literally, it was a horrible storm coming in while we were shooting that scene and trying to get it in under the wire before it started pouring down on us. And uh, yeah, I, I, it pains me to admit that it's one of the funniest scenes in the movie um, <laughs> because I hate to give Dylan any credit. But <laughs> it's, yeah, it, I, I don't know where he came up with it. He's an insane person. <laughs> It's, it's a good thing you've got that good working relationship and understanding. Yeah, yeah it's, we're, we're healthy. You know, we're like an old married couple who just bicker and yell at each other. No, well, I, I thought the fence gimmick worked because, uh, I mean, just from the concept and from the start, if people don't get what you're going for with this film, uh, I, I think they're just going to miss out on some of the enjoyment of it because, I, you know... It, you you can tell a film right away where you're just making a film for fun and where people take themselves too seriously. And and you managed, mm-hmm. at least to, it didn't come across that you took it too seriously. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you picked up on all my subtext about my theories on the Russian Revolution in this picture, but... Uh... No, it's uh, my I had a, a I have a pretentious friend who will remain nameless who um, after seeing some of my films asked me, he's like, don't you want to do something important, Paul? And I was like, why? There's so many boring, pretentious films out there. I was like, people, life is miserable. If you can turn your brain off and laugh at something stupid for an hour and change like that, that to me is the best time. So that's I'm glad to hear that that worked out for you. It it, it worked for me quite a bit. It uh. It, 
Jenna Francis, you got you got to be do some physical work in here. I have to say, I don't want to spoil the ending, but there's a specific stunt that you get to do in here at the very end. How many times did you have to do that? Was that a one take jump, or or did you have to wait to dry off and then do it again? <laughs> <laughs> so we were actually just gonna get it in one take um because that one day we were filming and we did do it that one time but then I think I came back another day just because I had to get in the water anyway so it's like why don't we just do it again just to make sure we have another one so I did it twice but but yeah it was really um intense I was pretty nervous to do it <laughs> were you were you really nervous because it looked good I mean I was like wow that was actually a I did not expect that. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Um, I'm not that great of a swimmer, and I so oh. I just I was a little nervous, <laughs> but I mean it. It went well, I think. You know, so made it out alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get that. You get that uh, shot under the pier too. It's in the trailer, so it's not a spoiler uh, of, of with the bird man behind you as well. How how cold was that water? Um. It actually wasn't really cold because it was the middle of summer, so it was oh, nice. it was nice. It was pretty nice. <laughs> like I, I think all day I had wanted to jump in the water because it was so hot outside, so <laughs> it was nice. So, Paul, where did you film this? Uh, where'd you find the location for this? So uh, yeah, it's a friend of mine's family's fishing camp in southern Mississippi. Um, so yeah, we went over there, and uh, like Jenna said, it was late July, early August. It was about. 95 to 100 degrees every single day just pouring sweat <laughs> in the the hell that is mississippi i uh, i don't like mississippi if you can't tell but <laughs> <laughs> it's fine <laughs> that that means that shed scene then later on when you you come upon the the hovel of jeeps uh had to be warm this oh yeah that, that was piping yeah it's uh it was a uh, overall. I mean, the, the shoot was amazing. Everybody was great, but it was brutal in terms of just the uh, we were all sweating bullets and and you know hydrating with Miller Lite. So it was not a. I was gonna say there there seemed to set. be a lot a lot of Miller Lite as a Wisconsinite <laughs> as a Wisconsinite. I will appreciate the amount of of beer that was consumed. Uh, during... Well, that's what if we could get a uh, point beer down here, man. That that's oh. what I want to put in the next one. Hey, there you go. Point beer. If you know, if you contacted them, they'd probably be more than happy to. Uh, I live like a mile away from Point Beer, so and, and the and the fact that you know Point Beer that just warms my heart quite a bit. Uh, I I worked for a guy from uh, Stevens Point for a while, and he would go on and on about Point Beer, and he got married, and I flew up to Wisconsin for his wedding, and he was like, "We got it here, Paul. We got it." I was so excited. <laughs> Sorry, I know that has nothing to do with the movie. Just Absolutely, no, I, I, I love some beer. Oh, are you, you kidding? <laughs> I I love it. I I'm a big you know I'm big uh, supporter of our state. So uh, there's reason though why we're the drunkest state in the country. But uh, that, <laughs> that's a whole other story. Uh, so your design of the Birdman was that your design or or where did that come up from? Yeah. Uh, so Taylor Fisher, who did the makeup for it, she's just a super talented makeup artist that I, I met through a friend of mine. And she worked on one of my previous movies. And I told her about this one. And she said, well, what do you want it to look like? And I said, I want it to be a guy with a bird for a head. She said, OK, but what do you want it to look like? And I said, Taylor, I don't care. As long as he has a bird head, figure it out. And so she sent me some stuff. And I was like, this is amazing. And then when she actually did the makeup, it was so much more unnerving than I expected it to be because <laughs> I thought it was going to be kind of silly. And then I look, you know, it's something strange because the guy who plays that character, Carter, I've known him for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And just to sit there and have a conversation with him as he's a half man, half bird was just something uncanny valley about it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I mean, it looked great. And during the credits, you have that uh, motion to where the, the work of the makeup they put on. How long did it take to get, get him in the makeup? He was in the chair for, I believe, about two and a half hours um, wow. every day. Yeah, to, to get that. Because it was, she started from scratch every time we had to put him in the makeup. So sure. she would, you know, bald cap and then paint the bald cap and glue on the the feathers and all this other stuff. Um, but yeah, and then taking it off was just brutal for him. So 
Well, and especially then being in the Mississippi heat, I'm sure didn't help either with feathers. And... Oh yeah, absolutely. The the beak kept falling off. That was the big mm-hmm. big issue with the just the moisture and stuff. <laughs> so in between takes, we'd have to glue his beak back on. That was a whole. <laughs> See, see, people don't realize the challenges you face when you're making an indie film. I exactly. <laughs> and, and you get those frustrations, but at least they don't come across on camera. Everybody still looks like they're keeping an upbeat spirit uh, during, yeah. during your trials. Uh, that I, you I think, uh, you know, we plied Carter with enough beer and stuff that he was he stayed upbeat in spite of his misery. Jenna, what did you think of, of the... Uh, bird man when you first saw him um (laughs) kind of kind of like what paul said it was like a little unnerving i mean it's funny but like definitely during the scenes when he had to chase me and everything i i did get a bit scared sometimes i didn't have to act you know because (laughs) he was just so close to me and it it was it was a bit scary but also funny it was weird That's a good thing. That's what you want from a horror film. Uh, <laughs> now, <laughs> now, now, are you a fan of horror films at all? I am not too big of a fan of horror films just because I get scared pretty easily. But I do like the films that make fun of horror films in a way like this one. Like kind of like the scary movies, movies you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Paul, with this... Uh, did you have to weigh when you're writing when when you're you were working with Dylan and writing the script just how silly and not silly to go because I liked the balance you had here for the spirit of the film and everything but I've seen some films where they go too far into the gimmick to where you're just like ah I won't I won't mention real names but let's just say there's one involving a a certain honey drink honey eating bear that uh could have been better but. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, definitely. I'm sorry. I'm repositioning okay. myself here. Absolutely. That that is a a very real concern, and I it's I'm it's one of those things I don't talk about too much because it makes me sound pretentious when, when I'm talking about like trying to find the proper balance there. You know, is I know it's a movie about a man who's got a freaking parrot for a head, so it's it sounds ridiculous to talk about but there is like there are things in the script or or in the shooting of the movie where it's like okay that's too stupid we we got to bo- dial that back mm-hmm. you know and trying to find it's a it's a needle that you have to thread to where if you go too far one way or the other it loses um you know it loses the charm i guess <laughs> and uh yeah so it's it's definitely a balancing act to to find that you know how much is how much how funny can you go and then how much scary stuff can you have in it because you don't want to tip too far in either direction for this type of thing yeah and just how much gore to show and how much gore not to show right <laughs> right <laughs> which i will say it not not quite as gory as i thought it would be but that that's fine i i don't mind at all I, because like you said it's a, it's a lighter film uh yeah. but you do have some in here uh the practical effects was that by choice too to try to stick with as much practical as possible yeah i personally i love practical effects and if i had more of a budget to do more gore and more practical effects i would (laughs) um but yeah i i i can't stand i mean i've done cgi in some previous films uh and there there was a former film of mine that I'm listed as a co-director on that I probably shouldn't be, but that's a whole other long story. (laughs) And me and the gentleman who was also directing it with me had some disagreements about use of CGI. And uh, so I I was very adamant on this one that we weren't going to use any CGI. (laughs) Uh, And and it it definitely works. It it definitely works for for the type of film it is. Again, uh, you know, and and you mentioned that, yeah, it is a silly film about a half bird, headed man chasing you know <laughs> Jenna Francis around it and other people around and killing them but at the same time you do have to take a a still the serious film approach of of crafting an entertaining story right it's not right. just it's not just you goofing off with this equipment you still have a crew and you still have people relying on you so you do have to put serious thought into a comedic film if that makes sense right <laughs> yeah absolutely that's uh it's you know, I think it's the difference between 
comedic films that are actually, you know, mm-hmm. at least at this level, you know, indie comedies that are funny versus indie comedies that feel like you're just hanging out and watching somebody else's inside jokes that you're not privy to. Now, how long did you have to shoot uh, Murderitaville? That's a good question. Um, so, you know, I don't have any money, Mark. So, uh, <laughs> n- no time. Spoken like it's a true the... indie filmmaker. Spoken <laughs> like a true indie filmmaker. <laughs> I, I think. I think all in, we did about five days of production. Because hmm. um, I believe it was two weekends, and then we did the underwater stuff separately. Hmm. Um, Which again, I so, surprised... yeah. I was surprised there was underwater too. I'm watching this and I'm like, oh, there we have <laughs> we have we have actual water stuff too. I uh, and and that's you know I think that just adds to the charm of the film for sure. Uh, Jenna Thank Francis, you. for your scene, was there a particular scene when you're reading this that you thought was going to be particularly difficult for you? Uh, I mean, we we talked about you, you know, near the end, the big climax. But was there one that you thought was going to be difficult, but when you when you did it, it actually rolled off real easy for you? It was it was actually a lot easier than you thought it would be. Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, I would probably say any of the times that I had to go into the water, mm-hmm. like so even like the end scene, if I was just jumping into the water just to swim around and stuff, I guess I was pretty nervous for it but it turned out to to not be that big of a deal and stuff I think whenever the first time I had to jump in the water Paul got in first because I was nervous so like he he made me feel better about it so it it wasn't that bad it was it was pretty good filming it <laughs> making sure there weren't any uh, animals in there Paul <laughs> <laughs> I was making sure that I didn't die of heat exhaustion is really what it was I oh. I said oh no Jen you're nervous I'll go ahead and jump in for you <laughs> Yeah. I'll do that as a director. I'll sacrifice <laughs> a, my dry yeah, clothes. For you guys. <laughs> if somebody hand me another beer while I go do this. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Jenna, with the rest of the cast, you seem to to really uh, mesh well with them. Did you have time to spend before you shot to meet them and, and everything? Or was it mostly you hopped on set and, and you was the first time you got to meet them? Yeah, the first time that I, I got on set was the first time I met everybody, including Paul. Um, so I was, I was pretty nervous because I didn't know what to expect from anybody or what anybody was like or anything. But everyone was super, super nice and um, just, just really funny and cool. And it was a good time overall. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. That's good to hear. And Paul, what about you? Uh, was there a shot that you thought was going to be particularly difficult that ended up going off pretty much without a hitch? Man, that's a good question. I there's plenty of shots that I thought were going to be easy that turned out to be very difficult. Sure. Uh, <laughs> but, Which is why I usually um, ask the question because it's easy to think of the the, the bad ones, but yeah. What did I think was going to be easy that or difficult rather that the um maybe the <laughs> I'll tell you the one that that's that I thought was going to be more difficult than it wound up being, which is um, when minor spoilers here, when a certain character falls out of a tree oh, yeah. um, and then proceeds to rattle off his, his diatribe about birds. Um, that particular actor, Sean is a, he's a dear friend of mine and he's one of the funniest people I've ever met in my entire life, but he cannot remember dialogue to save his life. Oh. It's uh, <laughs> he's, and he tries really hard. It just, for whatever reason, he, he you know, you'll say, Sean, say that the dog was brown. And Sean will say, the brown cat. And it's like, dude, just, <laughs> but uh, I don't know what happened. If if the, the sun was hot enough or the beer was flowing fast enough or what it was, but he actually was able to pull up the lines without too much of a hassle. So, so we'll take so that, that as a win. That was a written lie because the way he rattled it off, I, it almost felt improv as natural as he he rattled off. The... <laughs> it was it was a about a fifty fifty, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> there was a written concept and then some <laughs> derivation. <laughs> Jenna, was it hard on set sometimes not to break character during these scenes? Because I know watching as an audience member, there'd just be a, there'd be a line, and I just 
bust out laughing. So how hard was it to to keep a straight face? Um, yes, definitely. It was it was hard, <laughs> uh, especially when that scene you're talking about how Sean's character had to rattle off a whole bunch of different things about birds. I just had to walk away because like I kept almost wanting to laugh out loud and I didn't want to ruin, you know, so that was really funny. And then um the the bird poopy scene, if you will. Yes. <laughs> that was uh that was pretty hard not to laugh because Paul changed that that line like right at the last minute and I was like no not even poop I had to say poopy <laughs> it's really hard keeping it poopy is funnier I know <laughs> it is funnier because it's a word that doesn't get used as often as it probably should uh <laughs> yeah but you did well with that seed though Paul because it was definitely uh hearkening back to Jurassic Park uh <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> Although Laura Dern didn't didn't eat the poopy, but that's okay. No, uh, but <laughs> Jurassic Park would have been a better film if she had. That's <laughs> that's, that's the eat scene your heart every... out, Steven Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been the scene everybody remembered. It would have been not the great special effects. Did you see Laura yeah. Dern? She actually ate some dinosaur. Crap. She ate some dino poop. <laughs> Now, now, did he have like, did he have a visual reference for you, Jenna, uh, for that? Or did you just, you know, kind of imagine? Because I don't, you know, we don't actually see the poop. So, yeah, um, they actually went to the store and got me some ice cream. I think it was like cookies and cream ice cream. So it was like white. Yeah. Was a little out there. <laughs> and I, I kept dipping my finger in the, in the ice cream. <laughs> yeah. It's good you had a reference at least. And, you know, they didn't, they didn't go method and say, here yeah no no, thank you (laughs) yeah uh but uh for the production paul uh did you self-finance did you do crowdfunding did you oh no yeah this is all um out of my my pocket i i self-finance my movies and uh you know my children don't need to eat that much so it's it'll be fine they they can learn the varieties of how you can cook ramen in so many different that's ways. That's exactly right. That's you know, I got through college that way. They'll be fine. <laughs> you know? It's the college diet. Come on. <laughs> preparing them early. You're preparing them early. See, there you go. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so uh I, I have to ask, I, I know you worked on a limited budget. Was there a thought at any point of trying to possibly get a jimmy buffett song into your movie or uh did you just approach original artists <laughs> well the the thought was definitely there and then the realization of uh sure. how much money that would cost yeah. was one at one point i i thought about actually just doing a, a full-on version of uh margaritaville as murderitaville you know changing the lyrics and getting somebody to re-record that but i I don't know that much about legal liabilities and I, I didn't want to get sued. So, um, yeah, I, the, actually the guy who plays the parrot man is, uh, is a great musician and he wrote the, the two songs, two original songs that are in there. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's eventually all of my films seem to have weird original theme songs. So eventually I'll put out a, an album. of the. See, there you go. Put out an album of, of, you know, the Paul Dale great hits of, of cinema. Yeah, there you there go. You go. So, Paul, what's next for you? Are we going to get a Murderitaville sequel, or? Boy, I would love to do a Murderitaville sequel. Um, if if it does well, if there's <laughs> if anybody watches it, it'll. Uh... <laughs> I would love to do that. I do know. Um, next up will probably be a, a shark film. Actually, um, they are all long the explanation as to why. Yeah, they're they're doing. <laughs> the big hit thing right now i have uh you know anyway (laughs) so we'll probably do a shark movie next the one that i really want to do that uh will take me some time to sort out but if i can get my my stuff together i'll i'll definitely make it as a i have a horror romantic comedy musical sing-along drinking game film called uh when igor met sally and (laughs) it's about frankenstein's hunchback assistant finding love uh, and he has to hide the fact that he has her 
deceased, now reanimated fiance in his garage. Uh, so there's a love triangle going on. I, it's the funniest thing I've ever written. I really love it, but uh, it's it's got a lot of moving parts. It sounds like it. Uh, the drinking game part alone, though, you know, there you go. You do, you only have to write the beginning part really solid if it's a drinking game. <laughs> enough references, so by the end of it, everybody is sloshed, and so you know everything will be funny for them. That'll that'll make your yeah, writing. I think so. It'll make your writing. Look, I, I think that the more you drink during uh, any of my films, the better they get. So that's <laughs> just trying to bake it in. But but. It, but with Mar- Murderitaville, you've got to make it, you know, the frou-frou drinks, which I do enjoy, you know, pina colada. I enjoy a, pina, yeah. a good pina colada or, or margarita uh, at all. Were, were, Jenna, were any margaritas actually consumed during the filming of Murderitaville? I I don't think so. We made a margarita, but we just, like, fake made it. We didn't um. actually. Yeah. But there's mostly just a lot of beers. <laughs> <laughs> The main diet there. <laughs> that, yeah, I, there was some tequila. I don't think we had any proper mix. <laughs> we should just just drink the tequila straight. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> what, what is this? It tastes like tequila. Oh, it is tequila. It's straight tequila. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's next for you, Jenna? Then, um, well, I'm just currently auditioning a lot and um, staying in acting class and just trying to keep my eyes open for any role that could I could fit in um, but yeah very cool very cool so so Murder Ritaville uh, uh, didn't turn you away from acting at all that is what <laughs> no not at all <laughs> it was it was a fun project it was a uh, challenge <laughs> it, it definitely seems fun and uh, I'm really hoping that this has a lot of success uh, Paul where could they keep up with Murderitaville and where it's showing? I imagine it's still on the festival circuit, or is it getting distro? Or so, yeah. Murderitaville will be available on March first um, on Amazon and through our website, which is ByTheHorns.store. Uh, we'll have it on digital, Blu-ray, and VHS for all the tape heads Ooh. out there who still like that. Yeah. Um, and you can actually pre-order it right now on the website and it's like 20% off, I think up until between now and March 1st, if you want to go over there and I can tell you that if you're going to order it, please just buy it through the website. Cause Jeff Bezos doesn't need another rocket, you know, he's fine. <laughs> well, My well, children need more ramen. <laughs> <laughs> you should have that. You should have that on your website. Just as like the, the, the tagline, <laughs> the store of my children need more ramen. I'll have a picture of my two kids just sitting there looking hungry with an empty bowl in front of them. Your sales will increase by like 20%. There you go. Well, thank you both very much. This is very enjoyable. Folks, keep an eye out March 1st for Murderitaville. Yes, go to the website. I'll put a link in the description of this podcast for you to go and rent this fun film. Don't let it turn you off because it's an indie film. Uh, I I mean, I Paul, I'm sure you can attest to indie. You hear the word indie film, it kind of gets a stigma, doesn't it? It does, definitely. Yeah, there's a, you know, and I'm, it's fair enough to people. Like, I'm guilty of it, too. You know, I'm like, ah, I don't know, because there's a certain level of you don't know what you're going to get, right? If you're you're getting into an indie film, like an, a Hollywood movie, even if it sucks, you know, it has a certain level of production value, at least. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you that dollar for dollar, I think this is far more entertaining of a picture than anything Hollywood's put out in 20 years. There you go. <laughs> there There's you go. Pitch. Well, it, it's an indie <laughs> film, but don't let it turn away because I will say I, I appreciated the production quite a bit. And you won the audio battle. So that right there for any <laughs> for any indie production, if you can win the audio quality battle, I think uh, you, you've won. You're halfway there already. So. Yeah, I I actually we hired an an actual sound professional sound guy who worked with me on a reality TV show years ago to who came and did me a huge favor on this one. So because I've had some pictures that sounded like garbage and I didn't want to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thank you both very much. And yes, folks, keep an eye out for it and support indie cinema. Uh, I know I'll be going to the website now that I know you have VHS. I I have a lot of VHS. I, I collect physical <laughs> media, so. I'm going to have to uh, check that out for sure. So Sounds good. Uh, thank you very much, folks. And, and thank you, Paul. And thank you, uh, Jenna Francis, for an uh, uh, entertaining film, to be sure. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much, Mark. <laughs>